We're at the European Business Summit in Brussels and we're joined by Jankdish Bhagwati, University Professor of uh, Economics and Law at Columbia University. Thank How you. would you say um, the Obama administration is faring at the moment? We're still in the first 100 days. What sort of uh, scorecard would you give him? He's faced with challenges the same as uh, FDR, you know, uh, at the time of the New Deal. But on top of that, he's not <laughs> United States involved in military adventures in Iraq, and Afghanistan is almost certainly going to be at least as bad. Pakistan is disintegrating. Uh, one, you know, he's really got so many challenges on his hands. Uh, that he really has to, you know, one has to judge him relative to the, to the enormous challenges he faces. And I think he's, so far he has shown pretty good judgment in terms of going ahead and selecting rather good people to address the economic issues. Uh, I mean, you can always double guess, but after all, it's, it's his job and his responsibility. And I think he's done pretty well so far. Uh, and the, on foreign policy also, I think he's managed to make the move to begin to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, he may get trapped. North Korea, he's, he's going to have to run into problems, Iran. Um, but so far, he shows enormous energy uh, and it seems undaunted. Uh, I mean, an ordinary person would, <laughs> president would be overwhelmed. So I, I'm, you know, I'm reasonably optimistic, uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a tough slog definitely a tough slog. Well, Ben Bernanke, the uh, Fed chairman, was also reasonably optimistic in, in saying that he expected the U.S. economy to recover by the end of the year. Would you agree That may be a that? bit too optimistic, to tell you the truth, because I think on the, on the financial side, uh, there's so many problems because everything turns on where the trust transpires. Uh, the stock market is such a, an unreliable <laughs> indication of anything. It's, sometimes it just goes up dramatically like it did this week. Other times it sinks. Uh, it's um, one of the problems actually, that if I may speak for economists or against economists, which is my tribe, uh, every time any, anything is proposed, there are five economists getting their 15 minutes of fame on CNN or something uh, and saying nitpicking on this one, that one. Even my, my student Paul Krugman, who now has a Nobel Prize and should relax, but there he is always sniping away. Uh, and, you know, Larry Summers, of course, punches him quite effectively. But in the meantime, the fact that Paul Krugman is well known uh, creates in the minds of the ordinary people uh, who are going to be reacting to a variety of things in terms of the willingness to spend, the willingness to put up with the bailouts uh, and with uh, the, the financial, you know, purchase compensating uh, people who they attribute the entire uh, crisis to. All of that gets undermined, in my opinion, be, uh, by this continuous sniping. And I, you know, particularly when people like Krugman, uh, who's my most distinguished student, go, go ahead. Uh, I mean, they could, he could easily call up Larry Summers, whom he knows very well, and say, look, I think this is wrong. He could call up Bernanke also because they, you know, they were at Princeton together. Why does he have to do it on television and, you know, spreading this chaotic, sense of chaos around the place? So I, th I think. Obama, you know, he himself used it at one stage, you know, people are nitpicking. Uh, and I think there he is right. So uh, right now, I, whether despite all this noise and so on, whether we will in fact begin to turn the corner, is anybody's guess, because a lot depends in macroeconomics on people's expectations, how they will react to any proposal, but will they spend more when it's required? Will they save more when that is required instead? So, nobody should hazard a guess as to when it will happen. Though if I was in the president's place, or in Bernanke's place, I would be generating uh, noises like that, saying it's going to turn around, there are some indicators, simply because 
the more people believe that, the more they will start spending. So it becomes a self-fulfilling expectation. And you've got to restore confidence, essentially. That's exactly, that's the name of the game. Because if they f feel confident, then they will begin to spend money rather than hold on to it. You know, like even tax refund. I mean, if I think things are going to get worse, I'm going to hold on to the money because, by God, uh, the social safety net uh, in the United States is so uh, thin. And when you fall through that, if you're laid off, and then you fall back on your nuclear family, because they don't have extended families like in countries like India, where I come from. So you really uh, uh, fall back on your spouse, basically. And when you get married in church, you say, you, you, your pastor says, you got to, you know, stick to it through thick and thin. But when thin arrives, a lot of sociological studies of economic distress in the United States show that families just disintegrate. They can't take the, the tension. And when you fall through that, I mean, you know, it's really rough because you can, many people wind up homeless on the streets and so on. They disintegrate completely. Uh, there's really nothing to hold on to. And then you don't even have medical insurance for, for if you're not employed. So it is really a stark outcome. So in that situation, you're anxious as hell. Uh, you're terrified. And then you really uh, have to, if you're going to spend any money you've got, you have to have the sense that you're going to get out of it. If you think it's going to just continue in the impossible situation in which you find yourself, you're simply going to try and somehow, you know, spend as little as possible and get along in any way you can. And then the recovery will be delayed because if people don't spend, the, the businesses aren't going to spend either, right? Because there's no demand. Uh, so everything is tied together into generating that confidence. And so Obama, Bernanke, Larry Summers have to be sort of continuously generating the, you know, what they probably think is simply <laughs> PR. <laughs> saying to people, go ahead and, you know, don't be worried, we're going to turn the corner. But there's going to be more than spin, though. There's going to be some credibility and, and basis for the optimism, hasn't it? You're right. But I think what has happened is that I, I, one reason to be optimistic is that housing uh, purchases are happening. You see, when you think, think of it, the prices at which uh, the uh, houses under default are going are unbelievably low. Uh, uh, I mean, they're really going for a song. Now, given that situation, there should have been earlier an enormous amount of purchases by people trying to make money. I know people have bought houses uh, on the main coast of New Hampshire and so on, which is the, sort of the equivalent, more or less, of, uh, of the Riviera, you know, at prices which are incredibly low. I mean, if, if I knew how to manage things like that, I would have bought one too. And when people buy, of course the prices begin to move up. So these are foreclosed properties foreclosed, that being bought so it's a fraction of I the mean, price. They're really going for $10,000, $5,000, $150,000 houses. I mean, I see it on TV all the time. I think if the confidence spreads just a tiny bit, people are going to go for the bargains and that seems to be happening now. Whether it will keep building up, I don't know. But this is one of these things where you have a virtuous circle, you buy, the price begins to move up, then I buy because, you know, I, I, otherwise I'm going to miss a good bargain uh, if, if I put it off till late. And that way it builds up, you see. So I think there is, there is that indication uh, that things may begin to turn around. Uh, that, and that's where the crisis began, as you know, from the subprime mortgages. And they're pouring so much money, I mean, you know, uh, into, into the banks and so on. The, at, at some stage, uh, people are going to start investing, uh, simply because the terms you get and the prospects of payoff are so much improved now that I think there's some, some indication that I think equity investors are also coming in under the newly announced scheme under which there will be public-private partnership. But the public sector is putting in tons of money. 
the equity investors, private ones, are putting in a real, real fraction, but they're being promised basically a large payoff. And uh, um, so it's only if people begin to worry about that because of the, I mean, pe people meaning the populace who, who really don't understand why you have to do this. I mean, many of us would like to shoot up these, you know, line them up and shoot them, <laughs> but you can't do that. Uh, you, you just can't because you need them to be able to run the system. Without, without a credit system, without uh, a financial system, it just doesn't work. So your economy may be basically sound, but if there's no credit in the system, you can just simply cannot function. Do you think the government should have uh, rescued Lehman Brothers at the time? Was I that, think in that was a major failure? In retrospect, it was a major failure. But I think, again, you know, in, in these matters, it's impossible to see how people are going to react and so on. And I, I think the, 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 that was in terms of meeting the crisis. But the main, main thing which was, you know, people often said there were no, you know, uh, it was the ideology of the market, meaning uh, no intervention, which was really behind, behind the over leveraging, which the investment banks like Goldman Sachs did. But I don't think there's any evidence for that at all, because these, the, the big firms like Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley and uh, Goldman Sachs were interested in business. When you look at the background of uh, Hank uh, Paulson, who then went on to become the Treasury Secretary, when he was uh, head of uh, Goldman Sachs, and he went with, with these other guys to the Security and Exchange Commission and said, we don't need any kind of re prudential reserve requirements. I mean, it's unbelievable. That's what led to the over-leveraging. Now, why did they do that? Because more business would come in as a result. If you look at the background of uh, Hank Paulson, he's a graduate of Dartmouth College, which is a major liberal arts college. He, he gives a lot of money away to environmental causes for ever and ever. He's not an ideologue. I doubt if he's read Ayn Rand He's not a aficionado of Ayn Rand and libertarianism like uh, Alan Greenspan is. Alan Greenspan is an ideologue. So he went along with this. He didn't initiate it, but these guys looking for business did it. And they really underestimated what could happen in terms of the downside. And Charlie Schumer, who is the senator from, junior senator from New York, big intervention guy and so on, he supported not having any regulation at all uh, for these people. So it wasn't deregulation, it was failure to regulate on the ground that if they, if New York didn't do this, the business would go to London. This is what we call race to the bottom. So that's where you, some coordination is, will be necessary not to f fall into that trap. But these were the guys who did it. None of them can be called a, a, a market fundamentalist, in my opinion, at all. And so I think that's what you had. And then that combined with the subprime mortgages, where again, it was the ideology, which Mrs. Thatcher also shared, that you must have a home-owning democracy. So all Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, which are like quasi-governmental organization in the sense that they're backed up by a de facto guarantee from the government, they made all kinds of loans, subprime mortgages, uh, simply because the mandate was to keep expanding ownership to people who couldn't afford it. So that is exactly, that was almost the terms of reference of these. So when that market, so, so that fed the bubble on the housing market with mortgages which were simply worthless in, in terms of being able to, you know, the uh, people being able to service them. When that collapsed, that really then interacted with, with, with uh, the over-leveraging and then with the new instruments which had been devised like, um, you know, collateralized security. This is why I've proposed that we really need an independent uh, body of people who, who will look at all these new financial instruments uh, and look at the downside possibilities because when you're all caught up in the euphoria and you're part of what I call the Wall Street Treasury complex, pe people with the same ties, you know, talking to each other. I mean, there might be people like me or Schiller or someone talking from outside saying, look, this is dangerous. 
but we are not credible to them. You know, we are not, we are not part of that set. So you have to have people who understand the markets. So knowledgeable people like when Ben Bernanke retires uh, in a year, he would be a good person on it. Or Willem Bauter or Ken Rogoff, I mean, who, who are reasonably knowledgeable about the thing and whose job it is should be to, to work out the downside risk. That's essentially what the De La Rosier committee is basically recommended, that we appoint uh, a, 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 someone whose, whose job it is to assess long-term risk. But whether you call it long-term risk or short-term risk, you know, it is assessing risk. Essentially, it was a massive failure of risk assessment, risk control. Absolutely. And, and not being able to comprehend that these new instruments, I mean, the financial innovations, can have a downside during, you know, uh, which, is, which you don't have in non-financial innovation. Because when, when a PC gets invented, the guys who are making <laughs> the typewriter, they have to be phased out. This is what Schumpeter called creative destruction, right? And meaning a Luddite reaction of breaking the, <laughs> breaking the PC is not, you know, has to be avoided. That is, but very few people would say a PC was not worth inventing. And therefore, but when you say these new <laughs> instruments like collateralized security, or uh, see credit uh, default swaps. When these happen, or derivatives before that, uh, which under, un, underlay the LTCM crisis, then the fact that you're using the word innovation itself lulls you into thinking it must be like any, every other innovation. Because innovation is a, is a good word, <laughs> right? I mean, it's hard to think of any innovation as being bad. Maybe we should think of some neutral term which doesn't carry that, that baggage. But once you have that, then you, you, you're likely to be ignoring the downside. Uh, and because, again, the Wall Street Treasury complex they all get caught up in the same same optimistic assumptions. And I think, so this is why I've called it that in the financial sector innovation, because of the potential downside, it has the potential of becoming destructive creation, <laughs> to, to play on Schumpeter's word. And that's exactly what happened, you see. So I think I'm glad that people have moved into this, uh, uh, into thinking along those lines. Uh, and again, credit rating agencies, we know were not independent. Totally, they, uh, they were literally not uh, providing anything like a, an objective assessment. Uh, and so that again is another part, institutional reform that you need. If they're going to do anything, we must have regulation under which they cannot really be in an incestuous relationship with the people they're evaluating. So I think that that, whether you call it, I mean, I think it's, it's just regulation. Then I also know that people who are selling mortgages for, for, for the banks and for Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, they were not trained in anything. There was no, no licensing, nothing to be had, which is really unbelievable. <laughs> but this was someone on the uh, SEC, Security and Exchange Commission, a famous lawyer in the Columbia Law School. He told me. There's literally, I mean, you know, anybody could get up and start selling mortgages without knowing anything about how to assess risk of the person to whom you're selling it to. So there were so many places at which the risk assessment was really thrown to the winds. And there was optimistic scenarios all the time, no comprehension of the downside. Uh, the notion that any any innovation must be good. I mean, it was too rosy an assessment all the time by these people. So I, I think the uh, all this will have to be gradually changed. And you know, I think uh, they're now trying to appoint a, a new regulator. But if the regulator is then going to be just under, it's going to be looked at by people like Barney Frank and others, who in fact were involved in Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and so on. So the Congress was not, Congress may be independent of specific firms, but the Congress is itself caught up uh, in, in a great number of assumptions and so on. So I don't think their oversight is really what, 
what one needs. One needs a truly independent force, which is not responsible to the Congress, which is not responsible, which is not part of the, um, you know, of the Wall Street firms and so on, who is tru truly independent. Uh, and I think that that is the most important thing. And I think the Europeans and the Americans are kind of agreed on that. But you have to see what exactly, how to specify the terms. Uh, in the end, there will be risks taken which, which, which may become unjustified. Keynes once said, uh, the inevitable never happens. It's always the unexpected because you know how he used to exaggerate a little. But in a way, what I'm saying we should have is an independent group of real, real experts who will actually try and reduce the range of the unknown. That's all we can do. We can never really guess at what's going to happen in the future. But it's just like when Rumsfeld and Cheney go and, you know, have only one scenario for the, for the Iraq war, which is that it'll be over in six weeks like the previous one. And they never figured out a scenario as to what would happen if it lasted six years instead and not just six weeks. And they came a cropper, you see. So it's that downside scenario has to be thought of very hard in relation to any innovation that's going on, in my judgment. So we're going to have a period of uh, reform and change, as you say. I, th I think so. But um, how do you think the economy will look um, once we're out of the, uh, the deep hole that we're in at the moment? Well, I... I Assuming that we do get out of the, the deep hole. The economy, in, in principle, should keep functioning the way it always was because I think the credit crunch basically pushed it over the brink, right? And suddenly people lost their cool. So it's like moving out of any recession, except this is a very deep one. What I expect might happen, so we will fix the financial sector in these different ways we have been discussing. And we will pull out of the macroeconomic crisis. But that, is, that will be a searing experience because it's, it hasn't been that deep. Uh, in the you know since 1930s uh, and that I think is going to mean that a fair amount of populism will have to be contended with uh, and what form that will take in terms of what kinds of interventions and so on where they are not needed like in the non-financial sector that is you know is something I worry about like you typically find uh, now uh, Anybody who, who, is in, who is in manufacturing or any economic activity is immediately regarded with some suspicion that somehow anybody who works with markets, meaning in the capitalist system, somehow his morality has been seriously compromised. Uh, so I've been <clears throat> writing a lot and debating a lot, saying it's not that markets affect morality. Uh, I mean, that's a vulgar Marxist assumption. I, I can be working anywhere. Why should that affect the values I have on life? It's much more true that the morality you, you acquire through family, uh, through schools, through your community, your church, and, and, and in my case also reading great literature like the Russian literature when you read Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, the moral issues are posed. This is why they are great novels. And all of that affects the, the morals I bring to the way I function because you have different types of capitalism. You have, uh, you have several people who do corporate social responsibility, several others who don't. If you, so why is their morality so different? Uh, why do they <laughs> function in the same sort of marketplace and yet react very differently to, 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 to the way they're functioning? So I think it is really I mean, that's another thing, you know, wrong inference, uh, which is which I pile back with, you know, greed is the word used typically to describe people in business. And then even worse, avarice, which <laughs> being, being English, you know, is really, <laughs> that's really deep <laughs> hole into which you can be pushed. So those kinds of then, you know, self-interest, one can get away with, but everybody has some self-interest. Uh, self-love, <laughs> there's several degrees of criticism which can be leveled at people engaged in the marketplace. And I think if you start doing that uh, and ma making the wrong inference, that's going to undermine 
I, I think, and make it easier to have bad kinds of interventions uh, rather than good ones, which I'm, even in the non-financial sector, you do need some interventions, but they'll multiply, and, and the people who are uh, who will be operating them will belong to the same human race and, <laughs> and you have to worry about. What worries me more is about the developing countries, the poor countries, where we actually came from anti-market fundamentalism, where, you know, everything was subject to governmental intervention, markets were not allowed to function, uh, you had autarkic attitudes, almost a medieval attitude to profits and to multinationals, the medieval in the sense of what was, you know, the, the attitude towards usury, interest, and towards money lenders is, is kind of parallel to the attitude you find among many people, the, which has been intensified uh, about, you know, just simply being in business and <laughs> making profit. Those are dirty words now. I think that will have to be, we'll have to work hard at it to make sure we don't go from we, the, where we went from anti-market fundamentalism to pragmatism and, you know, using intervention when appropriate, markets when appropriate rather than uh, like with cap and trade system in environment, that's the creation of a market where you didn't have one, right? So that is markets. But, you know, now uh, people don't understand this and they think any use of markets is bad. So they're moving now into, uh, back into anti-market fundamentalism in, in the poor country. That's what worries me. I think the Far Eastern economies are much more sensible. They make distinctions and so on. I mean, they won't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, but I, I'm afraid about South America, uh, which is a culture which is given to exaggeration and wrong, or, you know, erroneous <laughs> arguments and in in inferences. Um, uh, I think there, there's some real danger because you already have people like Chavez and, you know, uh, and, uh, Morales and so on. And Ecuador has gone in that direction. So they are on the edge uh, of wrong choices, I think because I increasingly hear from South America, oh, we've tried everything, which of course they haven't, and nothing has worked, which of course isn't true either. But these exaggerations feeding into this hysteria against markets and so on, and into a reversion to anti-market fundamentalism could really hurt them, in my opinion. And that would be a terrible cost to pay, and ultimately they will pay it. I mean, not we really. But India is relatively proof because India knows exactly what it lived through and what damage it did when we had anti-market fundamentals. So they're, they're going to stick to a pragmatic mode. And, they, and today, the middle class has grown so enormously, they're not going to give it away just because a few uh, populists here are saying things like, you know, this shows markets didn't work. So this is a, you know, a sign of how people just get onto this hobby horse of, you know, attacking markets. So I think we've, our work is cut out for us because we've seen the use of markets, globalization, outward orientation, all of that de deliver a great deal of prosperity and reduction of poverty around the world. And to have that sacrifice due to wrong inferences from what happened in the financial sector seems to me to be exactly the wrong thing to do. In my globalization book, actually, I have a chapter where I say, on financial sector, where I say that is the soft underbelly, and you know things can go wrong, and I said the good arguments for globalization, which are more, you know, uh, given to saying it really works well, those are related to trade, direct investment, you know, what is sometimes called multinationals, and in my opinion, also on immigration. So I said those, those should be separated out, and that's the bulk of of globalization we talk about. Uh, and the financial sector, we have known for, for centuries, is given to panics, manias, uh, and so on. And so you really have to continue, continuously be in a struggle to see what's the next pitfall <laughs> facing us. Because, you know, uh, almost every, every decade there's, there's been some significant crisis. If you remember the famous October crash, everybody thought, not everybody, some of us were skeptical even at that time, that it, it was a complete collapse of the, of the market. We're going to get in 1930, 29 and 30 again. 
and nothing happened after that. And that, so, was, that was the Black Monday crash of Black uh, Monday 87. Crash. That's right, 87. But you would say that uh, there's no likelihood of a depression now that we've well, even that now stage. it's not in that in, in that because you see, uh, incomes have gone, but nowhere near uh, what we had uh, in, in in the right after the great crash, uh, and there's absolutely the unemployment was about twenty five percent then. And it's nowhere near that right now. Though there is underemployment because some people have stopped looking for work because they've sort of given up. But that's again, you know, even if you adjust for that, it's nowhere like the 25%. And what is different is, at that time, we had the wrong monetary policy because people thought tightening money was a way to have rectitude and then get back into business on, on the macroeconomics. That we know was the wrong thing to do. And there was no fiscal policy at that time. So, because Keynes is responsible for the fiscal policy revolution, and Keynes wrote this general theory of money <laughs> as a result of the crash, basically. So, but now we have fiscal policy. We have international, co you know, people really um, trying to get the stimulus up. We have people, you know, brilliant people trying to fix the financial system and so on. So I think the conditions are very different. And even on protection, while there are many places at which, you know, we have to worry and, and be on our guard, and uh, actually the uh, smooth hawley which was the 1930 tariff, that is already in the works. So right now, we've, we've been trying to liberalize on Doha, and that's being now stalled. But that's very different from saying, here is this protectionist legislation which is in the works, which then is going to be passed in the, in the, in the course of the crisis brought about by the 29 crash. We have some ability to survive, I mean, to, to even contain perhaps uh, a trade war. And of course, institutions like WTO are in place, which also are supposed to, based on the original GATT in 47, which were designed to prevent uh, to put up obstacles in terms of people freely raising trade barriers and, and hurting each other. So there are many dimensions on which I think it'd be astonishing if we didn't get a turnaround. And, and at, I would get at most two years since the crisis started. Uh, six months, uh, if I was a finance minister or in Bernanke's place, I would be saying three months <laughs> just to try and get some, <laughs> something going you know, on the part of the public. The only thing one can quarrel with Obama about is that maybe he should wait a couple of years before he does these things. First get the economy under control. That's Warren Buffett's criticism of him. And I, I tend to share it, actually, uh, because the most important thing is to get the economy going. Once you've done that, there's no question that everybody's going to vote for all the, the structural reforms that he wants. Uh, I, there's no no way to say no. The people will nitpick and so on and so forth. But I think that that is it's a, a two-step argument. And I think uh, if we fix that, we'll see a much more robust American-style capitalism. Once the system is fixed up, um, then I think he and you've provided the institutional support for the system to work in the modern age of volatility and international competition and losing jobs, you know, from time to time to international trade, while also gaining from it in a big way. That, I think, they will be able to, they will be able to do. And capitalism will look m more more acceptable because there are two conditions under which capitalism will is sustainable. One is where you don't flaunt your wealth, right? So if you're buying a yacht in, uh, in the Mediterranean or a castle in, in Rhineland, Nobody knows about it, so nobody cares. It doesn't have any political salience and response. I mean, that's one thing you could do. So you do not flaunt, do not display your wealth. And the other is that you use it like Calvinists and, you know, and the giants of Gujarat and so on, uh, where Gandhi came from. Uh, you, you, you just live like a common person, like you know, the Dutch burghers whom Simon Sharma wrote about and the embarrassment of riches. So you, you do it for good, you know, spend your wealth 
living frugally, but you, you make a lot of money, but you spend it on social purposes, which is really what CSR is all about, actually, in my judgment. Uh, and so those are two conditions under which you can have any amount of inequality. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and, and America doesn't mind inequality. Only right now it has. So I think if we'll have to, to have capitalism sustainable of the American variety, because America, they believe social mobility. But when they see ostentation, you know, because these guys were really living it up, uh, and, you know, and their salaries and their bonuses were growing continuously, you know, in front of people, even as their wages stagnated, then they began to resent it. So from what you're saying, it sounds as though business schools really have to look at this as well I think and, so. and change I think their so. curriculum. I, I very much think so. And I think the, uh, the, that capitalism cannot be sustained in the modern age where people get to see things uh, and where there tends to be continuous flux and which can affect people at the bottom, you really have, and then with technical change, labor saving technical changes, putting pressure on wages repeatedly, you better learn how to manage your capitalism. Capitalism is still the most powerful force, and I, I think this is, this is really where I think we need to go. So I, I would say sustainable capitalism has to be creative in managing uh, the resentments which are bound to follow if you're simply accumulating wealth and flaunting it or uh, but still it is amazing how much you can change values through courses exposure to ideas and so on because values are not immutable. Professor Jankdish Bhagwati, uh, Professor of Economics and Law at uh, Columbia University, thanks right. for joining us on Thank NCAA you. Knowledge.